Hi YouTube, it's Joshua Miles and welcome back to my channel. Today's video marks the second video on my channel in the Summer of True Crime series, but I think it's like the one, two, three, four, fifth or sixth video in the playlist. If you've missed any of the previous videos in the Summer of True Crime, be sure to go check out the playlist in the description so you can catch up and watch a bunch of really interesting cases brought to you by some really cool creators. Today's video is made in collaboration with one of my favorite all-time true crime YouTubers whose name is Molly Westbrook. Honestly, I knew Molly when she had 20 subscribers and now she has like almost a thousand. I am so proud of her. She is doing amazing. Her content is so underrated. It's I keep hitting the microphone. It's unreal. So be sure to jump over to her channel at the end of this video to go watch the case that we worked on together on her channel. Just a reminder to all my Patreon members out there, I posted the second update this week, which gave you a sneak preview into who I am collabing with this week and who's in the Summer of True Crime this week, and also a sneak preview into the cases. If you want to see exclusive videos like that and more, then be sure to head over to patreon.com forward slash Joshua Miles Almost all of my true crime videos at the moment are demonetized and every penny helps when you're spending a lot, a lot, a lot of hours researching and putting together cases for you. I'd just like to point out this video has not been made to cause disrespect or anything like that. It's just been made to spread awareness about this case by compiling information from various different public sources on the internet. I promise that I'll slow down my speech in this one because I got a comment a few videos ago saying that I talk really, really, really fast. Um, true, <laughs> my brain works in a bit of overdrive, but uh, I promise I'll try and slow down a little bit for this video. And with all that being said, let's delve right into this video. On January 3rd, 1949, carnival workers Lester Cecil Likens and Elizabeth Francis welcomed their third baby into the world. And this child was called Sylvia Likens. Now, interesting to note, Sylvia's two older siblings who were called Diana and Danny Likens were actually fraternal twins. And not long after Sylvia was born, Elizabeth actually fell pregnant for the third time with another pair of fraternal twins. And then they were named Jenny and Benny. Now, the family lived together in a home in Lebanon, Indiana, USA. And unfortunately, the Likens family was not a family that had a lot of money. In fact, the family actually had a lot of financial difficulties, which caused the marriage between Lester and Elizabeth to be quite turbulent. And due to the nature of their job, the family was often moving around a lot, following wherever the carnival went. They often struggled to make ends meet, with the highest form of education in the family being Lester's eighth grade education. Lester and Elizabeth, on top of working for the carnival and having to move their family around a lot, also had to care for and raise five children. Sadly, when Jenny, who was one of the younger pair of twins, was young, she actually contracted polio. And it was a result of contracting polio that caused her to become quite reserved, withdrawn, and shy. And the polio also caused Jenny to have a limp. Contrastingly, Sylvia was really, really confident and was quite the polar opposite to Jenny. Now, the entire family called Sylvia by her nickname, which was Cookie. And Sylvia was described by everybody who knew her as being a very confident, pretty girl. And this was despite the fact that she was actually missing one of her front teeth. At some point after the birth of Jenny and Benny, Lester and Elizabeth actually decided to leave the carnival and just try to find better work elsewhere and just try to make a better life for the young family. However, this plan sadly failed and in late July of 1965, Elizabeth was actually forced to shoplift from a local store because of the family's poor financial situation. And Elizabeth was caught for shoplifting and she was jailed for this and that forced Lester to go back and work for the carnival because he needed to feed his children. According to some sources, Elizabeth and Lester had actually separated before Elizabeth was caught for shoplifting. But after Elizabeth was released from jail, they both kind of tried to make the marriage work again just because they had children and so they wanted to try and fix their marriage, but unfortunately this was unsuccessful. So Elizabeth lived separately from Lester with Sylvia and Jenny and their daughter by this point had already grown up and gotten married so she wasn't living with either of them and Danny and Benny the couple's two sons actually went to go and live with their grandparents 
And this all meant that Lester was more able to work longer hours so that he could bring in more money to provide for his children. And because of the long hours that Lester worked, it was clear to see how his attempts at recouping the marriage between him and Elizabeth were just going unsuccessful. As you can imagine, rejoining the carnival meant that Lester didn't actually have a lot of time to look after the kids. And due to the family's financial situation, Lester was unable to afford to get some hired help in to look after the kids kids during the day and he couldn't afford to send the kids to a nursery either. Lester couldn't see a light at the end of the tunnel and he was at a complete loss of what to do next. That was when a family friend of the Likens family came to Lester and offered to look after Sylvia and Jenny for him. And as you can imagine, this was music to Lester's ears. So just like anybody would in his position, Lester accepted the offer. And this family friend that had made the offer to Lester was called Gertrude Banaszewski. Elizabeth quickly went back to working for the carnival alongside Lester. Just want to point out something that I had actually missed whilst uh, recording this video, um, I must have skipped it over in my notes, um, was that the carnival had moved to the west coast of America, which caused a lot of issues, you know, for the Likens family because they were, you know, living on the east coast of America and Gertrude lived on the east coast of America, so it made sense um, at this time that everything aligned that um, Lester and Elizabeth Likens would give the children to Gertrude so that they could go to the west coast of America to continue working with the carnival. Which meant the family was bringing in more and more money, improving the family's financial situation. Now to the Likens family, even though they were divided, everything was gradually and finally getting better for them. And Elizabeth and Lester actually decided that they would only keep Sylvia and Jenny with Gertrude for maybe another year or two while they got themselves back on their feet and improved their living situation and their family's situation. Now Gertrude wasn't actually in any better of a financial situation herself. She actually had seven kids which she raised in a very, very rundown and small family home. And Gertrude primarily made her living by ironing her neighbor's laundry, which was a service that she charged just just a couple dollars for. Gertrude had been divorced multiple times and unfortunately those divorces were very, very messy. She had been physically abused a lot during those divorces, which really badly affected her mental health. Gertrude suffered with crippling depression and subsequently she was taking strong doses of prescription antidepressants to treat this. To be honest, Gertrude didn't have the money or clearly the right mental state to be able to look after the Lycan children. However, as said earlier, Lester couldn't see any other option. Gertrude was his only option. And so Lester struck up an agreement with Gertrude that he would pay her $20 to look after his two girls and that Gertrude would straighten his daughters out. Everything was going well and everyone was happy during the first two weeks that Silver and Jenny stayed with Gertrude. The girls would spend their days playing with the other children out at the local park. Or if it was a rainy day, they would stay inside and listen to to Gertrude's small collection of records. Sylvia would help out with chores around the house. She would do the dishes and tidy the rooms. And she did her best to do absolutely everything that Gertrude ever asked of her. But at the end of the second week of their stay with Gertrude, an event would happen that would trigger something so, so evil inside of Gertrude. This is the curious case of Sylvia Likens. The weekly $20 check that Lester Likens would send Gertrude for looking after the girls didn't actually arrive on time. And so this made Gertrude really angry and she actually dragged Jenny and Sylvia upstairs to a bedroom and she slapped them really hard before shouting, well, took care of YouTube for a week for nothing. And this would be the beginning of a severe downward spiral of abuse. The $20 check had actually arrived the next day, so it was only a day late. However, by this point, something inside Gertrude had just snapped and there was no going back. Whenever Sylvia or Jenny did anything that Gertrude did not approve of, she would get out a large wooden paddle or a thick leather belt and beat them with it. And when Gertrude was feeling too weak or too lazy to beat the girls, she would actually get her daughter Paula to beat them for her. And it wasn't long before Gertrude chose a favourite of the girls to beat and that was Sylvia. 
Gertrude would literally encourage all of her children to beat up and abuse Sylvia physically and verbally. And she would even invite the neighborhood kids to come and join in the fun too. Now, not only would Gertrude get all the children in the neighborhood to join in in beating Sylvia, she would also force Sylvia's little sister, Jenny, to join in too. Gertrude would tell Jenny that if she didn't join in in beating Sylvia, then Jenny would take Sylvia's place. Now, on one occasion, Gertrude actually accused Sylvia of stealing from her. And even without proving that Sylvia had actually stolen from Gertrude, Gertrude decided to punish her. And Sylvia's punishment Gertrude burned the tips of her fingers. Gertrude would also let the neighborhood kids practice their judo on Sylvia. And that would often mean that Sylvia would be thrown against the wall or thrown on the floor and sometimes even held in chokeholds while they practiced those positions. They would even sometimes knock her unconscious with the handle of a broom. Gertrude then began to extinguish her cigarettes on Sylvia's bare skin. Paula, who was Gertrude's daughter, would actually use Sylvia as a punching bag. And on one occasion, Paula punched Sylvia so hard that Paula broke all the bones in her hand. And after Paula was rushed to hospital to have her hand put into a cast, she would then use that cast, that heavy, hard cast to hit Sylvia more. All the kids would watch this abuse unfold and would even laugh when Sylvia cried out in pain. Gertrude would force Sylvia to take a scalding hot bath so that Sylvia could be, quote, cleansed of her sins, unquote. Now this abuse gradually got worse and worse and worse, but in the rest of this video, I'm not gonna discuss any more of it unless it's absolutely vital to the case, just out of respect and just due to how gruesome and graphic the abuse God. Gertrude told everybody that Sylvia was a whore and that she was pregnant. Sylvia was also forced to strip completely naked in the living room in front of all the children and all the neighborhood kids and she was often also forced to insert glass bottles inside of her. However, I won't go into any more detail about that. And this abuse of her private areas was so severe that it meant that Sylvia couldn't control her bodily functions and so she would often soil and wet her mattress. And Gertrude decided that it was unacceptable and disgraceful that Sylvia would wet her mattress and so she sent her to go and live in the basement. Sylvia would be tied up and locked in the damp and dark basement completely naked. She was banned from using the toilet completely and she was only ever untied to get beaten or abused. Gertrude's children also took pleasure in pushing Sylvia down the stairs repeatedly. And Gertrude then got a neighborhood boy called Ricky Hobbs to write the words, I'm a prostitute and proud of it on Sylvia's stomach. And they would then heat needles to inflict further wounds and inscriptions on the 16 year old's body. Gertrude then forced Sylvia to handwrite a letter to her parents that told the story of how Sylvia had been performing favors for a gang of boys and the letter also blamed all of her injuries on this aforementioned gang of boys now there are autopsy photos and descriptions of the injuries that sylvia sustained i'm not going to show them in this video or go into that much detail but they are freely available online if you wish to look further into this case and if you wish to see just how much pain and abuse and injury that Gertrude inflicted on Sylvia during the time that she was supposed to be looking after her. Now, it wasn't long before Gertrude started to formulate a plan of getting rid of Sylvia. And she'd already put this plan to action by getting Sylvia to write this letter to her parents. Her plan was to dump Sylvia in some remote wooded area and then use this letter as evidence to show that she ran away or evidence to prove that Gertrude was not guilty for her disappearance or if her body is found her 
Gertrude had even prepared an alibi for her and her children to recount when they were questioned by the police. And she'd forced her kids to memorize this alibi so that they could recite it to any prying law enforcement officers. On the 25th of October 1965, Sylvia actually overheard Gertrude talking to somebody about her plan to get rid of Sylvia for good, and it was in that moment that Sylvia decided to plan her final escape. And this final escape would be her last desperate chance and attempt to escape Gertrude and the abuse that she was suffering. However, and so, so unfortunately, Sylvia was unsuccessful in her escape attempt, and due to her attempting to escape, Gertrude was not kind on punishing her for it. She was injured very, very greatly as a result of this. Sylvia sustained extremely severe injuries. The very next day, on the 26th of October 1965, Sylvia Likens succumbed to her injuries, and she passed away alone and tied up in the dark, cold basement. One of Gertrude's children and the neighborhood boy from earlier, Richard Hobbs, actually found Sylvia's body. They immediately began performing their limited knowledge of CPR and mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation on Sylvia. But Gertrude, when she came down into the basement to see what all the commotion was, immediately told them to stop performing CPR or resuscitation because she believed that Sylvia was just faking it. As soon as Gertrude realized that Sylvia was actually dead, she sent Richard to go and call the police. Gertrude then washed Sylvia's body in the bath, she dressed her in some nice clothes, and then she positioned her body on a nice mattress upstairs. And when the police arrived, Gertrude was very quick to hand over the letter that she forced Sylvia to write. And her kids just recited the same story that Gertrude had commanded them to say. And Gertrude had told the police that the gang of boys were actually the ones to beat up and murder Sylvia. And the police were pretty content with Gertrude's and the kids' story. That was until they were about to leave. Before the police did leave, Jenny actually tugged on one of the police officer's sleeves and said that she would tell them everything if they just got her out of there. After an extensive and detailed interview with Jenny, the police arrested Gertrude, her daughters Paula and Stephanie, her son John Richard Hobbs, who was the neighborhood boy, and a boy called Coy Hubbard, all on murder. Charges. On the 19th of May 1966, Gertrude was found guilty and sentenced to life in prison on a first degree murder charge. She has never shown any remorse for what she did. However, in 1985, Gertrude was actually released on parole under a new identity. But as the universe tends to do, and because of the law of karma, in 1990, Gertrude died after a short battle with lung cancer. Paula, who was Gertrude's daughter, was found guilty on a second degree murder charge and was also sentenced to life in prison. Richard Hobbs, Coy Hubbard, and Gertrude's son, John, were all found guilty on a manslaughter charge, and they were given sentences up to 21 years. Sylvia was buried by her parents in a beautiful ceremony in Oak Hill Cemetery in Lebanon, Indiana. And in June of 2001, a six-foot memorial was actually erected in memoriam of Sylvia Likens. And this memorial dedicated to Sylvia was erected and is still standing in Willard Park. And that is everything that we have for you in today's case. Be sure to let me know in the comment section down below what you think of this case. This case is so, so heartbreaking to me. It is one of those cases that has taken me ages to film and ages to research just because of how much it has affected me. It literally makes me almost tear up. Don't forget to go over to Molly's channel and check out the video and the case that we did over on her channel. That is also a really, really interesting case that I urge you to go check out and give your full support on. If you want to watch any other videos in the Summer of True Crime series, then there is a link to the playlist in my description box. There's also a link to Molly's channel. There's also a link to Molly's video on her channel. 
um, in the description box. So be sure to go check all those out. Also in the description, there is more information about the Summer of True Crime. I keep hitting my microphone. Uh, there's more information about the Summer of True Crime and uh, all the announced creators are also down there too. Don't forget to like, comment and subscribe and hit that bell icon so you can be notified every single time that I post and that is also every single time that a brand new Summer of True Crime video comes out. You don't want to miss a single case because each and every one of them is so interesting and complex and the vast majority of them are actually largely unknown cases that we're covering in this series. And with all that being said, I will see you in the next case. It's a part of the game In the beginning I just didn't know That you're an enemy I held too close Now I know Cause you did everything to prove me wrong You were not the guy I thought So go to Joshua Miles, the number one crime channel on YouTube oh! So go to Joshua Miles, the number one crime channel on YouTube Oh! Subscribe to Joshua Miles, number crime channel on YouTube. Oh!